Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to talk about a projective plane. So, to start off with, I want to have a look at the projective space and tell you how to put the geometry on projective space. And the way we'll do it is the same way that we put the geometry on the projective line. So let's first recall, what is the set of points of projective space? So projective space, P and F, is just going to be the set of one-dimensional subspaces of this vector space here, F to the N plus 1. And usually we'll use coordinates X0 up to Xn for that. So remember, in the case of the projective line, how do we put the geometry on that? Well, the idea was to use basic concepts from manifold theory. We'll describe it on certain subsets of it, where these geometries are well known, and then we glue these together. That's the basic idea. OK, so these subsets, they're often called affine patches. In the case of the projective line, they were just affine lines. In this case, for Pn, we'll need more patches. So we're going to need one for each index i from 0 up to n. And the best way to describe the patches is by constructing a map from affine n space to projective n space. So it's going to be indexed by this i here, n plus 1 patches, by i. And what does it do? So basically, you take an n tuple, and I have to send it to some one-dimensional subspace. So to give you a one-dimensional subspace, I just need to give you a basis vector for that one-dimensional subspace. And then send it to the span of that basis vector. And what is this basis vector here? To go from an n tuple to an n plus 1 tuple, all I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a 1 in the i-th slot. So, in this case, what you see is that the geometry that you can get from this Pn now can be imported from the geometry on this affine space here. Because this map is injective. And since this map is injective, you can say the geometry on this Ui which is the image of phi equals the geometry on An. And the key point here is that the union of all these Ui's, as i goes from 0 up to n, is the whole of Pn here. So you can write this Pn as a union of affine n space, n plus 1 copies of that, and so that allows you to do the geometry on this projective space in the neighborhood of any point. And the only thing that you have to check is that, well, did it matter which affine patch you worked with? And that's where the gluing comes in. So you have to work out how you glue from when you go from one patch to another. And you can check it quite easily that when you go from one to another, that gluing map is given by an algebraic function. And since it's an, an algebraic function, it doesn't matter which patch you work with. And in particular, algebraic functions are also smooth. So if your field happens to be the real numbers or the complex numbers, you also can patch together to get you a real manifold or a complex manifold, as the case may be. OK, so let's see exactly what happens in the case where n equals 2 and we have the projective plane. OK, so I gave you an informal description of what the projective plane was in my video on Bezu's theorem. I want to show you how this setup now precisely describes what's happening there. OK, so let's have a look at this affine patch in the case where i equals 2. So we're going to slot a 1 in the i equals 2 spot, which is the last one here. OK, so let's have a look at this map here and see what it does. So suppose you're given now an x0, x1. So what does it map to? We slot a 1 in the last spot, and we just look at the span of this vector here. 
So that's the line between zero and this point. So that's the line that you get. So that this map phi 2 in this case just maps x0, x1 here to this line here, just as we saw in the case for the projected line. So in the video on Bezu's theorem, we saw that we could obtain the projective plane from the affine plane in a very set way. Basically, to each line on the affine plane, we added a point at infinity. And then the set of all these points at infinity, that itself formed a line. And so it was an extension of this affine plane, which gave you the projective plane. And one of the things that I want to show you now is how this model of the projective plane precisely gives you all these features that I mentioned in that video. Okay, so the affine plane that we want to identify here is going to be just that affine patch U2. So you might as well think of it as this plane where x2 equals 1. Okay, so let's have a think about what are all the points inside the projective plane which are not inside this affine plane U2. Okay, so which are the points that are inside this affine plane? So they're all the lines which go through a point of this plane where x2 equals 1. So you can move it around like that, but the ones which don't go through such a point must be because the line is parallel to that plane. Since it also goes through the point 0, 0, 0, it has to be on the x0, x1 plane. So the set of all those lines representing points in the projective plane, which are not in U2, are just the one-dimensional subspaces of this two-dimensional space given by the x0, x1 plane, where x2 equals 0. Okay? So you're looking at just one-dimensional subspaces of something two-dimensional, of course. That's our description of what the projective line is. Okay. So this is a very nice fact that if you remove this affine patch from P2, you get a projective line. And in fact, this argument generalizes quite easily to show that if you have projective space, n-dimensional, and you remove one of the various affine patches ui, it doesn't matter which one, you'll in fact get something which is isomorphic to projective space, but of dimension n minus 1. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is about what happens when you consider an affine line inside U2. Okay, so let's have a look at that. We'll have a little look at a line in U2. So that's basically a line on this plane here. So let's draw something like that. And it goes on. Okay, of course the line is determined by two points, say like this one here and this one here. Now if you want to think of this as inside projective uh, space, in this case here the projective plane, of course this point corresponds to this one-dimensional subspace, and a point like this one corresponds to a one-dimensional subspace of this form. And as if you vary this point along this line, that one-dimensional subspace varies like that. And one of the things that you see is that the way it varies, it varies inside the plane spanned by this vector and this vector. So you get a two-dimensional subspace. And so all these lines, which correspond to points on this affine line, they'll lie on this plane, they're one-dimensional subspaces of this two-dimensional subspace. So the first thing to realize is that the set of all one-dimensional subspaces of this two-dimensional subspaces is, of course, a projective line. So in fact, you can extend this affine line to a projective line. Okay, so which of these one-dimensional subspaces corresponds to a point on the affine line? They're every one except for the one where you go to the one parallel to the plane x2 equals 1. Okay, so that's the only extra one-dimensional subspace that sits on that two-dimensional 
subspace spanned by these two points, which does it correspond to the point on the affine line. And of course, that's going to be our point at infinity. So the one-dimensional subspaces in the x0, x1 plane, they're all points at infinity. And the one corresponding to this affine line comes from, well, you take this plane that contains spanned by these two points, and you intersect it with the x0, x1 plane. So this recovers the fact that we saw before that you extend affine lines inside the affine plane by adding a point at infinity. So the last thing, why did we add all these points at infinity? Well, the main reason why is we wanted to preserve the principle of continuity, and in particular, we wanted to make sure that any two lines intersect in exactly one point. So let's see how that pans out in this situation here. Of course, when we say any two lines, we mean projective lines. So we can see now what projective lines correspond to. They correspond to two-dimensional subspaces of this three-dimensional space. So like the one spanned by these two vectors. And there's also an extra uh, line that corresponds to the line at infinity, which is the x0, x1 plane. That's also a two-dimensional subspace. So now let's see how any two lines in the projective plane intersect in one point. So here you'll have two two-dimensional subspaces. And let's suppose they're different. One like this and one like this. Now they have to intersect because they're subspaces, so they'll intersect in zero. And so what do you find? If they're distinct, they have to intersect in a one-dimensional subspace. And of course, a one-dimensional subspace or three-dimensional space is just a point in the projective plane. So we see this model completely describes in a rigorous way all the features that we wanted of the projective plane that was given in the video on Bezu's theorem. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.